99 Voices presents Broken on All Sides Movie Documentary. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our panelists and to read their bios. Our first panelist, Five Mulan Ak, is a civil rights advocate, organizer, with campaign to end the new Jim Crow. After serving 12 years in prison, five of that in solitary confinement, five embarked on campaigning against stop and frisk by outreaching to every housing community in New York City, teaching know your rights classes, strengthening cop watch, and forming the campaign for alternatives to isolated confinement. This work has brought together over 25 top organizations, drafted a SHU 200 reform bill, and also with a JAC, Jails Action Coalition, to form group, grow caring communities. Five has created various produce food pantries in every borough, which has continued to expand, and is also working with the Father Initiative Program of NYC, which, is, which now has a child support mediation program that allows men returning back to society to stay out of the court system. Please put your hands together for five years. And it is also my pleasure to introduce Matt Pillinger, the director. Matt Pillinger is a member of the National Lawyers Guild, International Socialist Organization, and Geographic PA. He majored in filmmaking in Bennington College in 2000, became an activist in 2003, which eventually that led him to law school in 2007. He graduated from Temple Beasley School of Law in 2010 and got a job out of law school with, at Community Legal Services, representing low-income Philadelphians who have employment problems due to their criminal records. During law school, Matt interned for the PA Institutional Law Project and the law firm Harry Rudinsky, Messing, and Feinberg, which both work heavily in prisoner rights. Having worked on jail overcrowding lawsuits with those two organizations and seeing a need for public education on the issue, walled from, walled off from the public scrutiny, Matt began producing a movie during his third year of law school about overcrowding in Philadelphia jails. That movie is both on all sides, race, mass incarceration, and the new vision for criminal justice in the U.S. I want to take a moment to also introduce the co-sponsor, uh, Professor Maureen Fader from the East Department. Please put your hands together for Professor Fader.
day was a day on which during the event, I felt like we had really come together here in Kingsboro as a community, as a village. And I was thinking that day, and thinking about it again today, and getting to a point in a second, um, that, you know, this cliche that people say, right, it takes a village. I don't know who said this, Hillary Clinton said this, right? Other people have said this, it takes a village. And I was thinking last year at our event about how it takes, it took a village, right, to save Trayvon Martin from the, the, the murder that befell him last, you know, two Februarys ago. Um, it takes a village to, to protect a person like Trayvon, um, a person like Sean Bell, and other victims of institutional violence. And I felt like that day at that event, which was so profound, we really did come together as a village, we really did come together and have what I think all of us felt was a really profound encounter. And so here we are again a year later, right? And we're thinking, I'm thinking anyway, now about what is it that we need to do to change the situation, the current situation around the issue of mass incarceration and around related issues like stop and frisk, um, police brutality, and these other examples of other modes of institutional violence. So the question being, how do we come together and make this village that's going to protect our sons and our daughters, citizens of this country, from this kind of violence, which the film is going to teach us a lot about. Um, I wanted to put this out there for everyone, just to sort of think about this question while we watch the film, with, you know, recognizing what the problem is, but also sort of going beyond that and beginning to think through, and hopefully we can talk about this after the film, what are we going to do about this, right? How are we going to act um, as citizens of this nation to protect our brothers and sisters who are being harmed through institutional violence, mass incarceration, stop and frisk, police brutality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's what I wanted to say. Um, now I'm going to ask Matt Pillisher, our filmmaker, to come up and say a few words about the film, to introduce the film, and then we're going to start the film, all right? Thank you uh, for having me today. I'm really excited. I came from Philly. Um, I actually know Maureen from growing up outside of Philly. Uh, we we were, lived in the same town, a strange connection. Um, so thank you very much for organizing this and having me. Um, I, I want to echo that sentiment that she, she said, that it's important to not only dissect the problem, but to really think about how do we fight this and how do we overcome this uh, disgusting system that we're under, which I hope the movie will illustrate as a new racial caste system um, and a new system of social control that is uh, a little more hidden than things like slavery and Jim Crow or outright, um, but through things like discretion that's built into the system, which allows for targeting of certain communities by police and prosecutors who have similar effects um, with the law today. So, I, I came at this movie from an activist point of view. I think most documentarians are filmmakers first and find a, an issue or a subject interesting, um, but I really came at this being a prisoner's rights activist and a criminal justice reform activist and a filmmaker secondarily. Uh, I'm also a lawyer that has worked with um, people in prison, that has worked with criminal defendants, and when I worked at Community Legal Services in Philadelphia, I saw firsthand the so-called collateral consequences of criminal records, which is sort of a secondary, invisible prison. Once, once people get out of you know, the concrete, steel, and behind the bars, you come out to a society where all kinds of laws prevent you from doing certain things that is eerily similar to Jim Crow. Uh, and you will see that in the movie. Um, so I worked as a lawyer around these issues, and I really came to understand that um, if there is going to be a movement to change things, to fight back, to put a better system in place than the one we have now for criminal justice, we need a serious movement, we need serious activism to the heights that ended slavery, that ended Jim Crow, that gave us any amazing social change in this country. I always say, we've never voted you know, our greatest social changes in this country. We've never voted for them. 
it, it hasn't been a leader giving them to us. It's been common people coming together, often led by students such as yourselves, um, you know, putting their lives on the line to change America for the better from since its founding. Um, so I think that is a, a really good uh, conversation to be having after the movie, and I'm happy to have five here um, with me and Kazembe when he shows up. For people here in New York City, that are actually ways to plug in for you if you're not already plugged into the activism to follow up. Um, so let me just say one other thing. I started making this movie my third year in law school in, in Philadelphia. I was working on a lawsuit suing the, the prison system um, and the city of Philadelphia for overcrowding in the, the city jails um, with a law firm that I was interning for. And, it seemed like the public didn't understand what was going on. And I think if any lawsuit is gonna be successful, it actually takes some public pressure, some public acknowledgement about what's actually going on. So I started making this movie to tell Philadelphians what's going on inside our city jails, about overcrowding and unconstitutional and horrible conditions inside. And then I expanded it, kept working on it, and I was able to obtain an interview with Michelle Alexander, who wrote The New Jim Crow, and I was reading that book, which really blew my mind, and thought she put together so well these arguments that I've heard before, that I've known, but there's something very compelling about the way she puts the arguments together um, that I think you can't deny that we're living under a, a new racial caste system that needs to be overthrown. So uh, I expanded the movie, and it sort of uses Philadelphia as an example of a national problem, systemic racism in the criminal justice system, but also talking about sort of priorities under a capitalist society where resources are not distributed equally, where we have the extreme haves and the extreme have-nots, and uh, criminal justice is very related to those issues. And so I finished the movie about a year ago, and I've been touring it around the country, really trying to do it in conjunction with activism and educators that are working on these issues to try and you know galvanize some people, more people, to get involved, to understand the issue, and to become involved. So I'm really happy to be here, and I think that's all I'll say for now. There's plenty to say afterwards, and um, I'll start the movie.
right? And the question of ecology that really kind of come through in terms of our relationship to each other. And I frame that in terms of this other question because I want us to imagine, I want us to think about a world at one point that did not have prisons. Prisons did not exist, always exist. I would even say that prisons came into it, came, you know, when we're thinking about uh, generalized, when we're thinking about the beginning of humanity, you know, people worked two hours a day and they spent the rest of their time talking and creating art and sharing. But what happened was that life got very hard for them. Life was very hard. People only lived for about 27, 30 years. So as we develop in terms of agriculture, in terms of developing, in terms of, uh, of creating uh, um, uh, specialized tools, then we had divisions in terms of labor. And as these divisions kind of came up, we had things called the state, right? And we had things called private property. Right? So when we're talking about prisons, we always have to go back to this question around private property. Because nine and ten, because you know, most of the crimes that we were talking about always has to deal with the idea of property. Right? So insofar as that we are, we reimagine a world, which this film is challenging us, we imagine a world without prisons. Can we reimagine a world without private property? Could we reimagine a world in which things are actually shared in common? And that people get enough what they need to get? That's one challenge. Second challenge is, can we reimagine a world of reconciliation and forgiveness? So much of our cultural sensibility is based upon the economy of revenge. Because specifically in this particular day and age, when we are all like, you know, te technically plugged in, we're not stepping back in terms of thinking about what that revenge actually does in terms of the impact of communities, right? So how do we deal with the question of reconciliation, right? Thirdly, can we, can we, can we think about a world and can we think about you know, a planet in which the question of for property and also having enough is, 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 is centered around global, right, and connected to each other, right? And those, those, are the, those are the challenges I think that we have in terms of thinking of a world without prisons. Um, I'm gonna share with you a couple of thoughts and, and before I wrap up and give the states over to a couple things, but I'm gonna give you a, a short story. 15 years ago, I was in Chiapas, Mexico, um, doing a solidarity work with a political movement known as the Zapatistas. There were indigenous movement seeking um, human rights in southern Mexico, without, throughout, the, throughout Mexico, uh, for indigenous folks, but also for all Mexicans. And they started a very, well-known global movement um, that was aimed at transforming the government, but also transforming the communities on the ground. And I went to Mexico, and it was my first time out of the country. And it was kind of hilarious because, you know, um, I was like, I stuck out like a sore thumb out there. Um, anyone who knows, like, I, you know, I'm a big guy, you know, you know, um, you know, huge, you know, people just like stopped in the street, but it's like, they didn't have a framework for me. So the first thing they said to me, they called me, they said, oh, okay. Michael Jordan. Because <laughs> they had no word for African American, right? They only understood that. So they were, Michael Jordan, right? And so I felt very much, they only call me, or they call me Payasa, which means in Spanish means clown, because they thought my skin was painted on. You know what I'm saying? And, or they call me also, or they call me there, right? But it was very funny because, but, you know, the thing about it was that I went down there to do solidarity work with this particular organization. You know, on the first night I was there, somebody had gotten, someone had gotten accused of stealing my chicken. And rather than putting this person in prison, the council of elders who were there argued throughout the night. What 
said to this person. And it was finally decided that rather than holding this person, this person would make a public apology to the village and then work for the family that he offended. So there's a context of forgiveness and reconciliation that we can talk about. So I want us to think about that in regards to the work of this challenge of this film, is that what is the work of reconciliation that we have to do in our own communities, amongst each other, but also can we get beyond the idea of punitive, beyond the idea of punishment? And not just the idea of punishment, but also the idea of kind of general punishment. Right? And you get beyond the idea of beyond prisons. And I think that's a kind of radical challenge that we have to offer ourselves in this space and age right now. Because the fact of the matter is that prisons are definitely a product of the, um, prisons are a product of what's happening within society and decisions that we're making within society. But they're not immutable. And like the, like the film suggests, we can create a movement to shift that public policy and shift that conversation away from prisons and towards more, to, towards a, a common humanity that we all share. And um, I'll, I'll just leave the comments right there. Again, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. And I look forward to listening to what you have to say. Punishment 
let me at least decide, take a whole day, even a whole town, a whole village, to decide on what the punishment for this person should be to fit the crime, of course, in order to uh, proper reintegrate them back into society or correction sometimes what they've done wrong. But when you look at a society and you judge the laws that enforce the actions, and the actions are overnight convictions, where the actions are mass incarceration, because we live in a country where we're addicted to incarceration. We've been addicted to incarceration. So, um, quick couple of facts. Currently, there are over 2.5 million people incarcerated in America, which is a lot per landmass. Of course, New York State is the leader of that. Um, so, per landmass, America is a pretty good continent. We have 2.5 million people. Okay, that's only, we only have 4% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's incarcerated, 80% of the So. When you say addicted to mass incarceration, you have to look at it on two different levels. So one level, of course, is the numbers. So of course you say, yeah, you know, other countries are worse. And somewhat of a, a misbelief of facts. Because if you have to take France and Germany, and you take Iraq, and you put China involved, as far as all the incarcerated rate. Then you add Turkey, and you add Berlin also, then we still don't have enough as far as America. We still have more incarcerated. So, you have to look at what is the addiction to mass incarceration. Why do we lock up? Why do we have so many prisons? Of course, I speak from the eye, so I'm going to derail for a moment on New York State. New York State has more prisons per landmass than anywhere on the planet. And you have to understand that there's only two countries on the planet that incarcerate at 16 and 8 age as adults. It's America and Somalia. Um, that's because um, the United Nations, who Juan Mendes, who's the official control of torture for other countries, one of our biggest solitary supporters. United Nations puts sanctions on other countries for torture and what they do and how they incarcerate other people, but of course, they don't mind doing it to themselves. So as I say this, because I encourage your studies to go beyond of what the prison statistics is, beyond why our family members are incarcerated, to the history of it, and the history of culture, and to why we so quickly judge and incarcerate our own people we have become financially addicted to institutions. Because mm -hmm. I don't call prisons prisons anymore, I them, but they are prison industrial complexes. And the history of this goes back to slavery, of course, and beyond that. Goes back to caste control, system control. But why are we addicted to incarceration? And I say New York State, and I use that as a, as a function. So Attica was one of the most famous prisons in New York State. But Attica was formed in a town is made out of the prison. Because it used to be a swamp and a jail, that was it. And then they built a graveyard, they was killing so many people there. So it was a swamp, the graveyard, the jail. And then they built the community center, and then they built the housing, and then they built the stores, and then they built the out of it. So our towns have become, our economical system in the area radius of that prison has become dependent on the system. And you have CEOs there that say, listen, man, this is, this is job security. I mean, my son just put an application in, my cousin works here, my brother works here, my father was a CEO, my uncle was a CEO, and the town become dependent on it, physically, as employees. And then the town builds development, economic structure off of the prison system itself, too. Because you have to understand that the trades that are offered, quote unquote trades, because they're not useful much to do at least, but these trades, New York State, for example, like maintenance. Okay, so the jail has it out to why are you in jail? So they say, okay, it's a correctional facility, and we're correcting the behaviors of illegal activities that stem to his incarceration, so we're going to give him a trade. And the trade will teach him to do something when he gets out. But this trade is being financed, of course, by a, a sole company or a private entity that actually is incorporated by the jail, commissioned by the jail, and the employees are the inmates, of course. So these employees clean the gym. He gets paid for that. He lives outside the town. His biggest company thrives over that. Same thing for electrical, floor covering, plumbing, and basically and things like that. But if you look at the country in a whole, we make all the license plates come from prison. Every license plate comes from prison. Most of the town development comes from prisons. Most of the town outside minimum security projects are done from prisoners. And the future of the taxpayers pay for that. Health coverage. 
paid for by the prison. Minimum wage, 16 cents an hour. Slave labor, paid for by the prison. It's paid for by the citizens. But these towns become financially developed for them. So you're from Brooklyn. You get sentenced to 10 years. They send you 10 minutes away from camp. Clinton down here. Mm -hmm. Eight, nine, 10 hours away. Your family don't visit you that much. But you can get visits every day. Just who can travel seven hours to come visit you. Why is this separation necessary? Why is it the breaking of the family structure? Because it's job security for these prison structures. So the prison industrial complex, which of course is the same corporations that do the housing projects, the same elevator company or this elevator, the same aircraft materials that polish the floors, strip the floors, and produce tenable, is made in Ohio. The same steel materials is built in Africa. The same fabrics and t-shirts and socks. So it becomes a self-sufficient entity itself. Mm -hmm. So every inmate, federal of course, tax dollars, pay for every bar soap, every bed sheet, every t-shirt, every sock. It's become a self-sufficient industry of support. And we are, in some sense, the capital. So when I say the prison industrial complex, of course, Coycraft is a one of the most worst private public companies because it makes 100% profit. Doesn't pay for employees. It doesn't pay for, doesn't have to have an EIN number or FIN number. They have to have a DIN number. That's all they have. And they have infinite possibilities of employees. They don't pay for health care coverage. They make products that service other city agencies and companies and corporations. All the courthouses, the clean courthouse, the courtground materials, all the housing projects, which I do a collage on Instagram on social media activists also. And I put prisons, pictures of prisons, and pictures of projects next to each other, and I pick it up, which is which. Mm -hmm. Because the same masonry contracted company are built to build the prisons that built the projects. So, as a story that came to me last week, and I want to close out here because I'll be a bit better. So. <laughs> um, so, a director of another film that's about solitary confinement had related a story to me while he was doing his travels and filming, and um, he ran into this you know, contracting agency. And the contract is to build prisons. He was like, hey, huh. <laughs> what kind of messed up person would this be to build prisons? Like, this guy must be like a jerk, like, you know. And as I did a lot of activism with Stop and Frisk, trying to build up that to the pace, and um, doing a lot of community outreach. Because when I came home, it was different for me to Let me just say this. Um, I left the community to go outside, and, and, and Jay got a barbecue going, Brenda got a baby shower going, you know what I mean? And everybody's outside the store, and the community came home and it was an outdoor prison. Like it's a guard tower, it's a police tower. And everybody's running around and it's trespassing no matter where you go. I'm in front of my building, you're trespassing. It's a bench built to the ground. You know? You're gonna tell me I'm trespassing where I live at? Like right in front of me is trespassing? Well, you know, you can't go. So I go of course to the store. Oh, you're trespassing. It's operating clean hallways. That's clean hallways. I'm in front of the building. What do you mean? So it becomes an oppressed neighborhood. And historically, this has been done since the 1800s. This has been done in Chinese communities, cultures. This has been done in the first grades of ghettos in Lithuania, in Russia, and Germany, where they would take a class structure of people and usher them into a small neighborhood and then police around them and then incarcerate them and then just say, fuck, let's just kill them. You know, let's get over it. Screw my name. So, um, it's, it's, it, it becomes, you have to ask the reason why. Why, beyond the financial means, beyond, okay, I, okay, five, I understand that. It's empowerment for the country. It's how this country's built. It's how these towns thrive. But why am I the target, being you, you? Because you are the next generation of prosperity. You are, right now at this point, in these institutions of higher education, in programs such as Brother Michael has here, to inspire to be better is the perfect time to catch you. The perfect time to get you shot back, broke, struggling, and give you the rest of your life inside of prison, with these rules and these quote unquote society laws. And it's a turning point for you right now, which is why we love it, the campaign to reach out to education. It's a turning point to where you can either fight for the problem or be a part of the problem. You know? It's part of being a part of the solution by awakening, educating, activate, and you have a choice to make. Either I'm gonna be susceptible to this, or I'm gonna fight this, or I'm gonna know this. And this is gonna take knowledge, education, and being active. 
So activation is the want to not to be the statistics that they have planned for you. They have plenty of statistics planned for you. There's plenty of few options with that, you know what I mean? Um, when you say mass incarceration, it comes from a stem of multitudes being poured into the court. Mm -hmm. A lot of reporters from elsewhere has come over and try to do them and stuff. They say, hey, man, we all know about mass incarceration. You know, we want to talk to you guys, and we have streets. Hey, we have no problem. Meet me at the courthouse at um, you know, 8.30 in the morning. I'm just going to show you something. But every courthouse and every borough has blocks and blocks. Just to get into court, it takes you that much. This is what mass incarceration is. This is what multitudes being poured in. And then you take those images, and you take those stop and frisk images we were on the wall, and you flash back 20 years, you flash back 30 years, you flash back 40 years, and these same oppressionistic tactics have been used over and over again. So I ask y'all as a next generation, is what is enough is enough? When are we gonna actually make change? And that's gonna take molding the future, which is only yours. So, thank you. Really help in that movement. 
but the movement is essential. We have to come together. And I firmly believe, I will say this and I will stop. Prior to the introduction of slavery and slave trade in the United States, we had something called the indentured servant system. Mm -hmm. Now, the indentured servant system was where the, the whites from Europe were brought in to work on the plantation. But somehow, the whites and the blacks used to work together. They work together and they cooperate together and they strike together and they run away together and they do things together. And they divided them. I think it started somewhere in Virginia where there was a strike in Virginia and they decided to divide the whites from the blacks. So somehow there had been that disconnection that white seems to be um, somehow superior uh, to blacks and uh, I'm not sure where that whole notion came from, but you know, it's, 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 it's stupidity I call it in, in a sense because it's really, it doesn't make any sense. And we have been dividing ever since. And, but what we have to do now is that whether you are white or black or, I think, you know, race, race is not a, even a, a reality, really. I'm sure some of you know that. That there is nothing really called race because race is, is really an illusion. I mean, biology doesn't prove race. So one of the things that we have to do is to try to bring the brothers together, brothers, sisters, everyone together in order to fight the mass incarceration. Because I believe it was, um, I'm not sure who said so, but I think it was Angela Davis and she said, if they come for me in the morning, they come in for you at night. Exactly. Never, never forget that. Because you might, you might say to the world, it's, it's not me, it's black and, and it's fine. But remember, tomorrow it will be the Jewish community, it will be the Asian community, it will be the white community, it will be every one of us, you understand? So we have to come together. Somehow we must come together. And by coming together, we could, as Michelle has said, said, no one thought that Jim Crow was going to be stopped. But it did. The civil rights movement came, and, and the K movement, and, and the students' movements, and, and everyone worked, and, and they worked, and they struggled in order to stop the, the, civil, the, the, the Jim Crow laws, and Jim Crow laws was abolished. Well, I'm not sure if it's abolished here, because when you really look at it, we, we wonder, you know, as Michelle Alexander said, you know, the new Jim Crow. And there is a new form of Jim Crow, and that is the mass incarceration. So you find that every time we try to make some form of progress, the progress has been, um, you know, there is a backward movement, and, and so we have to try to understand that. But we have to come together by progressive people, by advocates, by activists, by students, by faculty, by, by every one of us, and either we come together and we able to make something. But we've got to understand that it's coming for every one of us. Every one of us will be, you know, under the mass incarceration, because, you know, I think it was John Steinbeck that wrote The Grips of Wrath, and in the book, The Grips of Wrath, he, he said, you know, they need profit, and they have to have it, he said. You've got to have the profit, you have to have it. And when the black community run out, what will happen? It's, it's going to be the Hispanic community, it's going to be the Asian community, it's going to be the Jewish community, it's going to be the Italian community, it's going to be every one of us. So we have to move, and we have to understand, we have to have the vision, and the vision is essential. And once we have the vision, we will be able to move forward. But we need that movement, and the movement has to start. But it must start with the students, because the students have always been at the forefront of making some kind of progress within the United States. It has always been there. Um, uh, I'm just asking, I will start with this. The idea of the, the strike that, that took place in Georgia, and I think Michelle Alexander you know, spoke about it. That. that was an interesting strike. But you know, the media never really, you never heard that in the media because I was following and it was only from the end I was getting some information from that. But you never heard anything about, from that in the media. Like there was no strike taking place in the prison. And that was one of a massive strike. And there was even, I think, other states or other prisoners who joined in the strike. And this is what we, we need. So we need, when one stand, you know, we could be able to join together, we could be able to come together. Because it's going to be a movement that is going to change. Because we need to change the country. We need to change the mass incarceration. It is just beyond, you know, and as Brian said, the United States have over 25 percent of the prison population, 4 percent of the world population, but 25 percent of the prison population. This is you know, insane. That's insanity, and we have to stop it. But we must stop it, and we must come together, and that's essential. Um, and as the brother talked about the situation in Mexico, there is something called retroactive justice, and retroactive justice is something that we also have to 
try to look at because it is the same thing that happened in Mexico. It's something similar. It's starting to something in Australia where they are saying that let's come together. If something had happened, let's come together. Let's see if we could really come together and, and unite. Uh, unite with the victim and the offender and the families and the society and the community and everyone. Let's see why why people do things. You know, let's see why it happened. Because you know, in the United States, we don't we don't check on why it happened. We just say incarcerated. And that's something that we have to stop. So we, we know we must get a movement and the movement has to come together so we could to fight the mass incarceration, which is really key for us. Thank you. Against mass incarceration. I'll tell you why. 
Um, Keeney was founded as a free academy in New York. You know what I'm saying? And Keeney was free during the Great Depression. Through every single up and down economic moment, Keeney was free. So when you're talking about broken on all sides, what you're talking about when Keeney started charging tuition was during the neoliberal moment of 1975 when the, when the city controllers said, and you're speaking about upstate, said New York City no longer has an autonomous economy. The economy of New York City, which, which runs New York State, right? New York, City, New York State without New York City would be Ohio. <laughs> you, know what I'm saying? you know what I'm saying? But you don't have home rule in terms of this level in the tax base to say what we want to do with our own money. You know, from the Wall Street billionaires to what you pay your taxes in, right? So in 1975, the decision was made that we'll start charging tuition in Cuba. This is exactly happened at the exact same time that Cuba became a majority of people of color. Because in 1969, there was a movement called Open Admissions, right? Which demanded that any person who, who graduated from a high school in New York City got free admission to Cuban campuses. And got in. And if you did not, if you did not have the academic qualifications, you got seek, right? Or you got like, you know, you got like remediation. So, and now that's all been cut off. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a graduate of like UCLA. That would be the University of the Court of Lexington Avenue, Hunter College. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and I remember the struggles in the 1990s when you're talking about, because we connected the question of mass incarceration to the question of availability of education. Because we asked the question, if folks ain't going to college, where are they going? So to answer the question that, in addition to what the brother said, forming organizations, there has to be a free community. And free community also not only means free tuition, but also geography of community as well. The, 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 the kind of security measures at the public university that really ha that happens right now. When I went to Hunter College, if you wanted to go talk to a professor, and you came from the community, all you had to do was walk on campus. You know, and say, okay, I want to talk to you. You know, they ask the question. If you wanted to, you know, you wanted to go to a class, you just went into the class, right? Now we have a situation where the geography of community campuses are cut off from the community. So when you go to Hunter, my alma mater, they ask you for your ID. You know, so when we talk about free community and against mass incarceration, we also have to talk about geography. You know, opening up the doors so the community can also be in contact with the with the campuses. As well, so but I think I think the brother is correct. We really do need to, you know, start small, build those forces on the ground, and develop that and, and create demands. You know, and, and with any demand, you also create a what else, you know, a what if, right? So that's the power of the, the, the thing. So.
because I, I gotta love, you know, we gotta love each other, and we gotta make sure that we protect each other. I think our level of protection is very important. So I think that we must start dealing some form of, of consciousness for us, and in order to come together. And then once we, we understand and, and we know we love each other, and we know we, we're going to you know, stand with each other, we're going to protect each other, you know, like what the, the, the tripartite um, state did in World War II, right? If you touch one, you, you touch all. I think that's what they did. So I think we have to really build that level. And I think it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult. But we have to come together to do that. And in the meantime, we have to start. And I agree with brother, we have to start something. But we must start with, you know, some... I don't want to, I don't want to start and then collapse. So, you know, like we have someone who is planted. And I believe now they have a lot more civilians than, than they did in the 1960s, you know. So we got to really be strong and, and we got to, you know, work with each other, um, you know, cooperatively, you know, unify with each other. But understand that we cannot destroy our own brother. We cannot do that. Because if we do that, we just will be going back to the, we, we wouldn't learn from the history that, that, that from our past, from the Black Panther movement or from the civil rights movement or from any other movement, you know, the, the Occupy, and we cannot do that. We, we got to really form. Because love is going to be important. I, I want to love my brother, and I'm not going to sell him up. Because it's easy to sell up. I'm telling you, it's very, very easy to sell up. Because you know, everyone sometimes works for a price. But you have to have that dignity that you're not going to be paid in order to sell your brothers and sisters out. And I think we have to do that.
and what challenges, uh, the challenges that we face and how we should try to overcome them and take on that leadership that we should as the next generation. So, so I think that uh, the first speaker talked about sort of the nature of individualism in America, and that's very strong, and everyone here sort of touched on that. And what we understand is we need a collective solution. You know, we need a collective movement to fight back. And so I think the powers that be actually love the ideas of these big historical figures, these movement leaders, this sort of hero complex. But we don't understand that there were tons of people behind Martin Luther King. You know, there were tons of people that Martin Luther King was working with. There were the armed guards that walked around with him every day and protected him from assassination attempts. You know, there were lots of women involved with the movements. There were lots of women before Rosa Parks um, that did the same thing that she did. But it's in the interest of the powers that be to say, you need to be a giant like that in order to make change. So, I mean, what follows from that is don't even try. Or like, how do you get to that point, you know? But, so I think it's, it's, it's incumbent upon, upon us to, to realize that these people, you know, were people just like us. And that it was actually the movement that made these great changes. It was not any individual. Um, and, you know, it makes us think then, well, a lot of people had great hopes in Obama. A lot of people have great hopes in electing one or another person. But it cannot be one individual. And even if Obama had great ideas for making changes, unless there is a movement there holding his feet to the fire, there are tons of companies and corporations holding his feet to the fire behind closed doors that we're competing with, right? So I think we need to fight against sort of this hero complex, and of course we should look up to people like Malcolm X, like Martin Luther King, like Rosa Parks, but understand they were in and rose out of and got their power from a movement. So I'll, I'll end there. Um, I, I want to say two things. I'm going to say uh, three things. One of them is going to be situated now. One of them is going to be situated in the past. And then the last thing is going to be counterintuitive. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say is that Eric B. told about him the MC moves the crowd. Right? And, you know, and, and I think that that's very instructive because I think that in ways in which we think about movement, we don't think about it in terms of physical body. And I think that the thing is that we have to get out of the carceral mindset in ways we don't think about the ways we protest. So what so I, what I say to you is that if you're, young, if you're a young person, what you have in terms of your ability is your ability to be social and to grow parties and to really get people to get to get people together. Um, which I think is very important. You know, when you talk about Martin Luther King. You know, Martin Luther King loved to party, right? And he, you know what I'm saying? He was good friends with Lisa Franklin. He was good friends with Mahalia Jackson. He listened to music. He, you know, he, he enjoyed that level of, of, of connection. And I want to say something else too about your historical moment right now. Um, you know, um, there was a term that was um, coined by Booker T. Washington called the New Negro. Um, and that term was used by Elaine Locke in the, in the mythology describing the home renaissance. And the new Negro were the, the, the generation of African Americans who were born post-slavery. And they were young, and they were rambunctious, and they challenged convention, right? And, they, and, they, and that's the generation that invented the blues, and that's the generation that invented um, jazz. You know, and they didn't care about any conventions whatsoever. Now you're the generation, right? as born some 50 years after the end of Jim Crow. You guys are rambunctious. You guys have created hip hop. You guys have created all sorts of different music that I don't even know about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you guys, I'm looking forward to your playlist. I'm you guys friend on Facebook. <laughs> you know? And, 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 and you guys are breaking all sorts of conventions. So the question is of a good MC or a good, of a good artist is they dip into history and then did they break it? Yeah. So then you know the material, then you break it apart and then you remix it. The, the counterintuitive thing I would say to you is stop listening to me. I'm 
am 37 years old. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and the fact of the matter is, is that my, my particular set of knowledge is based into the 1990s. So I can tell you a few historical points, but in terms of you being able to do it, you gotta tell me something. And one of the things about the 1960s that no one talks about was that there weren't a lot of older people telling the younger people what to do. So you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna, you're gonna make error. You're gonna piss people off. But there's no such thing as making a mistake and not making a, create, creating a movement. The civil rights movement was not just this new movement. Retail branches book about all the wild things that happened in the civil rights movement. From speeding tickets to people getting to fight with each other, but, they, but, the, but the core of it was this. They under, they, in the words of Franz Fanon, they understood the historical mission and they sought to fulfill it. And that's the role of the young people. To find your historical mission and fulfill it. And that's the level in which we need to move in terms of doing that stuff. And that's the question in terms of young people, but also thinking about how we go forward in terms of building the movement. So you have to be something valuable if they want to tear apart that. 
So it's saying that, that, oh, you're looking up to these multitude of people, but it takes the people to make that multitude of man. And all these people did was teach. So honestly, Malcolm, Martin, everybody was trying to train the next generation. That's what they were doing. And that's what their job is to try to change the And I just say at a time that they were the only one doing, or maybe one out of 15 doing it, so they had a lot of notoriety to do it. But get positioned as being the one who knows the knowledge to be able to convince people and understand the system of structure against you, I mean, structure the system against you, is necessary because that's what makes you the mountain in itself. Mm. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple statements. Not really questions, but I'm addressing the audience. Um, make yourself change. Be your first movement. The revolution will not be televised because your growth every day is the revolution. The revolution through evolution. Join a club so you can grow. And other clubs. Because you grow cultures and races, you get a piece of who they are and that becomes you. You become them. Be careful what you put in your mind, especially television, because I worked in the entertainment industry. Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. It's, it's, it's I'm going back. I'm going back and I'm ready. So I'm, I'm, I got something for you. That's not good. Um, be inquisitive. Want to learn. You're here. You've been here. Set you, set you apart from people in your neighborhood. You have to understand that you being here right now listening, stroke, you come to school, but you being in here, that says, that says a lot. You may not understand that now. When you go home, you're thinking about this. You're still so letting your children know, right? Now, God is love. All the time. God is love. God is good, right? What is good? Love is good. I love love. God is good. So try to, be, try to love each man for who they are. Even if you do not, you may not understand why he did what he did to you or what she did to you, but that person could be going through the same things you're going through. The reason why they're acting out is because they don't know how to control it, you know how to control it. Love that person for what they did. Not for what they did, but for who they are and for the potential for them to change. Mark Luther King said the best. Love that enemy, right? So. <laughs> Hey, my name is Fury. I'm a student here, uh, but I'd like to say more than that. I'm an activist, and um, for, thanks everyone for coming. Great movie, great comments. First, I want to say, as an activist, um, I really encourage you to just not really care about the repercussions and just read and be engaged and have conversations. Like my man, who just I don't know where he went. The guy who just spoke up right there. <laughs> Like this brother right here just said, um, the new Jim Crow is over there. Read that book. I just read the book. It's amazing. Um, if you can't afford to buy it, get it at the library. It's at the New York Public Library. That's a really good starting book. Um, then just, I do have some questions. Um, <laughs> um, I'm actually a part of um, Brothers United. That's a club here on campus, and um, we we're based. We're primarily based in the MRC, which is the room. Uh, what's the room number? U two eighteen, which is actually down the hall. It's the, the, the room right now. Right, right all the way by the end of the, the hallway. So stop just some time. You will grow. Sorry. So I had a pretty specific question for the filmmaker, but also if anyone else might know about this. I thought I found it extremely discouraging that the mayor of Philadelphia was in the movie and yet he really couldn't do that much about the situation. Uh, this was a guy who was mayor for eight years and uh, I just wanted someone to speak on that. Does that really speak to how broken the system is that the goddamn mayor can't really change anything? Uh, and then I wanted to ask, uh, just in turn, I, I've heard some pretty not too good things about what Obama's done on the war on drugs. It's kind of the same old business as usual 
and stuff. But if you have some information, anyone here, the four of you, or anyone else out there, I don't know, uh, about what Obama's done regarding the war on drugs, uh, and prison, and if there's been any kind of legislative progress being made, or anything like that, um, like that's, a, that's about it. But yeah, again, just power to the people. <laughs> <laughs> There's a new beer all night. So, I talked to the mayor after he was out of office. And we know how politicians are. Um, you know, Clinton's saying all kinds of, Bill Clinton, some of the harshest, nastiest ramp up of law enforcement happened under our Democratic savior, Bill Clinton. <laughs> Um, he's now like sort of like, oh, I, I realized that the mistakes I made of over-criminalization and three strata and all, you know, all the horrible things I've done. Well, you know, they have the room to do that after they're out of office. So I, I don't, you know, politicians are politicians. Um, I will say, you know, again, putting hopes and putting one person in the office, this in the office, and probably you guys can speak to this. There's also been hopes, I think, in communities of color that if we get some of our faces into you know, leadership positions across the board, you know, black cops, black commissioners, black mayors, black president, that there will be some changes. And what I think it shows is that this system grew up under white supremacy, and as long as the system operates, it doesn't matter who's at the helm of the ship. You know, we need to dismantle the ship and build a new one. And so, again, you could have some great people coming into office. If there's not some pressure on them to actually change things, we know there is pressure from the one person. We know there is pressure there. Um, and then I'll say, I'll try and be quick because I know we all want to talk. Um, I like what you said about learning from other cultures, learning from other people. And I say, a good first step for becoming involved with these prison issues is um, rights to prisoners. And we have a lot to learn from the people inside. Um, and it's more than just sort of like a good natured thing, be a pen pal. It's like you can actually really learn from the people inside. Um, and I, I certainly did. Um, and I also wanted to say something about, you know, sort of coming across races and building a multiracial movement. If we're going to be successful, it does have to be a multiracial movement. And we do have to understand that the 99% is multiracial, and that the only reason the 1% stay the 1% is because they keep the 99% divided by race, by sex, by sexual orientation, by religion, by ethnicity. Um, but I want to also speak against sort of like this um, patronizing point of view. It's like, I want to help those prisoners because they have it so rough. I want to help those black people because it's, you know, it's such a shame the way they live. And, and so, and I'm very conscious of this as a white person, you know, talking about uh, an issue that mostly affects people of color. And I always like to bring up this old Aboriginal quote that says, from the ab Aboriginal perspective, if you're coming here because you want to help me, then you're wasting your time. But if you're coming here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Mm. And that's why I'm doing the work that I do, because I think that I'm also oppressed in this society, and that I too would have a lot to benefit from the end of racism and the end of criminal justice, as, as we know at the end of this prison system as we know it. Very difficult to follow the questions. I have to make a point of one single issue. I think it happened on, in Tennessee on the 5th of April, where um, the Klan the, the Klan march in Tennessee on the 5th of April. Um, this one, right? Yeah. Um, the Klan was marching because Nathan Bedford Forrest, who started the Klan um, in 1866, um, I believe he's 
there is a street name after him and there is some statue that was put up. And, and they wanted to, to, to bring this thing down also. And, and, and also, um, well, you know, Jefferson Davis was the head of the Confederate um, government in the South. And they also wanted to rename one of the street and the clan decided that that's not going to happen. Now, the issue that Brett was raising was that there has been black mayors in Tennessee before, and the black mayors did nothing about the situation. Um, but interestingly, when the Klan match on, on the 5th, um, there was lots of protection. There was police protection, and, and the people who were the activists who were um, trying to allow the Klan, I mean, prevent the Klan from matching, uh, they were the ones that was you know, kind of uh, brutalized and, and, and ostracized and, and stuff. So, so, so the interesting thing is that sometimes, uh, you know, the more things change, the more it remains the same. And, and we have to, you know, and that's why, as the brother said, we really have to, to build the movement, but the movement has to build on a, on a very conscious level. So we got to understand these things and, and understand that we are living in, in, in a very, you know, that one of the most dangerous eras in, for, for you as, as young people, because it's tough and, and it's difficult. But we can make it, I mean, uh, yeah, and you know, we have to put together. But if we unite, we could really do it. Uh, we always say unity, unity, but we, we must form that that unified front because if we don't, then what is the alternative? You know, there's no alternative. So we only got a one way street out, and, and it's to come together and to fight the, the, the people who are destroying us. The young brother spoke and he said a quote which is very powerful, which I just want to emulate more and uh, piggyback on it. It was kind of uh, So the quote is actually from a religious text. It says, love your enemy, pray for them, then despitefully use them. And this was a text that was used. It says, love your enemy, pray for them, then despitefully use you. So the terminology is meant, and Martin Luther King has said this a lot, that you love your enemy. Because someone who is opposing you inside your community, oh, he's a lame, he's a lame, blah, 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 blah. So through education, through understanding why the conditions are placed upon this person, why they act the way they do, why they are emulating the stigmatization of their communities, why the oppression has caused them to be that, understanding that supersedes your hatred or retaliation or sort of like your rebuttal toward that. You see what I'm saying? So you love them because your cure is seeking the cure for all that problems. It, it overshoots them. You know what I mean? So by all, by looking for the, to attack the bigger problem, which may come without your life, I, I'm content to understand, Martin understood this, and Malcolm understood this, that the solution may not come within my lifetime. So the next 10, 20 years, I'm gonna fight toward the solution that's gonna come in your generation. You see what I'm saying? So I am dedicated to the solution of the problem, not for the name of it, not for the fame of it, for the solution of the problem. And that supersedes your hatred for me. So I am one to attack the problem that makes you problematic. You see what I'm saying? So that's where the term love your enemy comes from because you understand his pain. You understand why he does it. Now he's positive. Um, the other comment, that what I had to say. Um, <clears throat> one of your questions was about legislators, which I would like to address. Because the rules, of course, are what enforce these abilities of oppression and things like that. So what steps have been taken legislatively? I came home about a year ago, and um, I seen a lot of agencies and, and organizations that wasn't working together. Two or three over here, five or six over here, just like this school. In some senses, everybody even know, like I have a friend of mine who's my partner also, who's with me here tonight. He has a saying, he always says, it's saying, you know, loving and knowing your neighbor. Because everybody even know the person sitting next to them and connecting the dots in some sense. So right now, there's everybody in here who knows the person next to them? Show your hands. <laughs> that's pretty good. Because <laughs> usually in a crowd of like three, four hundred, you may have five or six people. So that's the first step, is knowing who is next to you in your organization. So during that, it came to my attention that one of the things that the campaign at New Drink Pro does is that we organize and use groups to connect each other. So we have a, a legislative around uh, solitary confinement, of course, and while from prison. 
Um, Tom Jacob Fine was touring show, of course. So we went to different agencies, and three or four might have worked together, five or six might have worked together, but there was 80 organizations all together on the same cause. It didn't, like, it didn't make sense. So we started formulating them together, and we actually drafted a reform bill where we sent the commission officially until they let you quit. Um, so this reform bill is incorporating about 40 to 50 organizations, top organizations, set up the Constitutional Rights, New York City Union, uh, um, um, all the lawyers, the Lawyers Guild, all the public attorneys, all the defendants, Bronx defendants, everybody together drafting the bill together. So this is cooperation, you know what I mean? Just like you have different clubs here, find a commonality in which y'all can do events. And if you have an event, why are you not at an event? If you have one club, why are you not his club event? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So this is what we use together. We also form legislation as far as, like I said, as uh, solitary confinement. So it's different from states and city jobs. So we always have another one for city jobs. We also formed a mediation project along with Alan Farrell for the partner of the Fallen Initiative, which we started, and it's a parent project, which takes the court's power out of parolees and people coming home from prison. But that started from another formation that we did inside of prisons and jails called the Parenting Program, which if you take a parenting class, we say this thing, but everybody's just allowed it. And it would allow uh, prisoners, in some sense, to take a parenting class, keep a good discipline, and get better visits, which was the first step is to bring community trust together. But none of these things would be possible, none of this legislation would have been supported if I didn't literally go to every assemblyman's office, go to every councilman's office, and then when they were in all me, I'm in all No problem, you up there, I'm up there. I'd be just like, hey, man, what was this there? Like, yes. And I also brought every community board leader with me, I also brought every uh, Neighborhood Association, Tenant Association uh, president with me, also with the community center director with me, and he's happy to be out here. Since this is your entire district right here, we have five minutes to talk real quick about this issue we have. So, by organization, you create strength. So I say that, that the next form of legislation, you say, all oh, these rules are against me. No problem, the rules are made by the people. That's why the terminology, all power to the people, because when you come together, you are the people, and these people are the voices. So when you say legislative, you mean, Individual representatives who are the voice of certain districts. That's how the district is set up. But this all comes from you. This is your choice. This is a person that you says is your voice. So where you live at, who's your assembly and who's your council? Exactly. We talk have to stop it. You know what I mean? We have to hold these people accountable. Talk about, somebody talk about how Obama um, dropped the number of years for the, for the drugs. Crap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 What is it? No, he was saying, he, yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. ratio between the uh, number of years or something like that, the Obama signed in his last term. I can talk. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's open okay. okay. it more. Excuse me. Oh, sorry, did you say something? Who else wants to speak? Come. Come. Yeah. Do you want to talk? He's saying, in order to sell this prison, the it's like, you know, hey, look, I got this business going, I got all these customers, just like Jay-Z created Rock and Rock and Wear, and he, I think he spent 10 million, million in two or three years and sold it for 286 million. So it's, it's, it's about, thank you. <laughs> so it's about building up the equity in it and building up the hype around it, and then doing a bunch of videos and advertisement, and this and here, this is a preparable package for sale. And that's what this caste system has been, this is what slavery has always been. You, you, you feed them, you let them work out, and you put them on the stage and you tell them to slave. And this is why we even more of an example of slavery. So uh, they bought Lake Erie, actually, in New York State. And wow. They made $37 million in one year in profit. Why did they do that? Because they contract out the private laundry facilities, they project out to different corporations, and they make money off of the backs of slaves. And this is constitutional law that literally has the context of slavery in it. Like literally, it said slavery is amended if you have been committed a crime. So these privatized industries, and I encourage everybody to Google it. You know, I always say, don't take my word for it. You're know, going Google it. And you look up and you look at this corporation, look at this website, and you're like, and you don't see not one picture of it in it. You don't see no one, one person solitary, not one disassociated uh, family structure, not one prison visit, not one solitary cell, which you see is stocks and prizes and prizes and, 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 and graphs and charts, and you're like, Oh, you know, interest rate is up, and such and such investments are here. They be around the word convict, prisoner, everything. Everything shiny, happy, clean. You see these nice little security guards from CSA. It's incredible. So uh, they have a thing in Vanderbilt University, which makes me believe that I'm going to actually a few days called Rethinking Prisons. Vanderbilt University, my team members is there, Michelle Scott, there. It's incredible. Um, 
So Vanderbilt University got dedicated the university itself to rethinking prisons for a year, and it shifted a lot of activists around it, took a whole bunch of the activists and sent them to a CSA uh, prison convention about how they make all these tools for prisons and all these privatized corporations. And there's a video clip of that, and it would be incredible for you to use in your catalog, of how they use all this stuff, and nobody understood it, or they're so desensitized because profit is involved, and once you quit gain and dependability of that gain is what America has grown over. And the need for that. Just like the cultivation of the resources that we have, cotton, the agricultural farming, has been done with lots of slavery, slowly as these private corporations have been living with that. But they just go around the humanization of it. So the dehumanization of slavery and the disassociation of commonality of being a human toward it was, oh, well, they're three-fifths of a person, so technically they're not even humans. We're doing them a favor. And it's the same thing with prison. The prison system, like this film shows, tears the families apart. And because they're considered lesser than society, they're deemed the bad people, it's okay to do that. You know what I mean? So CSA is one of the largest ones. What's that video called? It's on the website for CSA. But the video, um, CCA? I, CCA. Sorry. And then GEO is also the private corporation. We're getting close to out of time. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I just want to say this really briefly. First of all, thank you so much for your great work. Um, I work primarily as a cultural historian, so excuse me if I'm always my comments are always kind of looking backwards, always trying to look back. That's the same Kofa symbol. You know, we look backwards to understand the past, uh, to be pres to stay in the present, to look towards the future. So I'm always looking back this and this. You know, like looking at that. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, you know, I, I, a book that you should also read is called Adam Hawk's Child's Bury the Chains, which is about Bury, Bury the Chains, which is about the ending of slavery in, in, in England and the movement against slavery. Things that we take very much for granted, like buttons that we wore on the lapel, were innovated by these, the anti slave movement, abolitionist movement. In, um, in England, um, many of the pictures that we, we see, um, specifically, a, you know, there's a very, very famous big picture of a black um, African American, slave African American with wood marks on the back. That's something that came out of postcards that were handed out, you know, consistently. This is what slavery is. So one of the things I want to kind of speak about what you said, brother. And what she said, and what she said, and, and I'm thinking so much for the, the, the film, is the visual vocabulary that we need to have. Because the question of prisons is a question of invisibility. You know what I'm saying? It's always being pushed to the background. And part of what we have to do as activists, particularly as AGD too, and anyone has a camera on their phone or camera to shoot or whatever, is push the question of visibility to the foreground. You know what I'm saying? And make visible the invisibility of what prisons actually feel like and look like. So that's why I think it's really useful to have films like this, the YouTube clip that you mentioned, and to develop a sensibility around this is what we're looking at all around. This last thing briefly, I want to make a quick connection between prisons and, 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 and education. Um, I like what you said earlier about um, talking about the industrial complex. The fact of the matter is that, you know, when, when slavery was, was started, it wasn't actually governments who were running slavery. What they did was they, they issued a charter. So there's a connection between the privatization and slavery. You know? So now in, in 2013, what do you have? You have charter schools where you actually connect the, the giving of you know the permission to do business from the government. And so what this brother's talking about is something that goes back hundreds of years in terms of the U.S. government, the certain governments making that happen. So I think the question in terms of legalistically, I really wanted to have a question now, is can we legalistically challenge this very salient notion of mercantile capitalism that's been bringing us down in terms of that? And I just want to say, I, I want to pop up. How much time is it? What time is it? Six or five. Six or five. We were supposed to be done at 6, but let's just, as long as they don't kick us out. Let's be done by 6.30. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like we have 20 minutes left. We have about 20 minutes. Uh, there's a lot to say. So I think it's 8% of prisoners are in private prisons. And 
that's doubled in the last 10 years. Um, but a lot of prison services and all kinds of things inside public prisons are privatized to make a profit for the people. Um, crack cocaine versus powder cocaine used to be 100 times worse penalty for crack. Obama made it 18 times worse. So better. Still an extreme injustice. Um, I think the key to all this is humanizing people, and the way every oppression has been able to be carried out, it's not the majority of the population doing the oppressing. It's a few people, but the majority goes along with it, or turns their back to it. Um, so, you know, it takes, like, becoming informed, you know, spouting off the statistics for your family, for your friends, that's, that's, that's really important. I also want to say that we also have to look to the people perhaps closest to us. We don't have to try and convince the hardline Republican to join a movement. They're the last that are going to join, so ignore them for now. Um, we need we can work on the people that are closest to us. You know, get them involved, and we grow and we grow. And then people have to become involved. You have to be on the right side of history at a certain point. Um, I think it's very real though, over, overcoming the apathy. I think you talked about somebody talked. About. Um, yeah, it's difficult, but I think that, um, I think most people know that the society is extremely screwed up and are, you know, there's anger simmering under the surface. You never know when that's going to pop up. But we need to have organizations and groups in place to take advantage of it when it does. So we can organize around some individual cases, like the Trayvon Martin case, for example. It was an explosion of activism and organizing, but it wasn't sustained. So how do we sustain yeah. that and turn that into a real, serious, organized movement? Um, and we have to work with what we have now. So what we have now is you have a bunch of people in this room who are interested in this subject, doing something about it. So like build these student groups, like the 99, Voice. the 99 Voice. Voices one, right? Um, and I, I love what you had to say, brother. I love what you had to say, you know, that people turn to negativity because, uh, um, because they have no other way out. That it's easier to find guns and drugs than applications for jobs. That's very true. And we are, capitalist society drives itself into the ground. You, you know, you talked about Earth Day. I mean, we are either going to drive this planet into the ground or we are going to change the way we organize ourselves, okay? And a society that says you can have drugs, guns, or jail to huge swaths of the population, that society is not gonna last in one way or another. And so I think we need to get involved with what is going on now, but understand there has always been simmering anger in this country. And there are times when it feels like nobody's gonna do anything, you know, nothing's gonna happen. And then there are times when there are just explosions where years happen, decades happen in days, yes. right? So let's start to sort of think about, look back at the history, but also like, like Five said, you are gonna come up with new ideas. You need to look at history so you don't make the same mistakes, but you're welcome to make new mistakes as we're trying to get a better future. I like to harness this energy and passion that we got right now, because I figure whoever stuck around for the Q&A really had, you know, really have a passion for this. So, my proposal is to, for everyone to put their names on the sheets right now so I can go make copies and for us to communicate and sort of become a little organized, you know what I mean? And, and strategically put ourselves in place where we can actively go out and make movement. Names and emails. Starting with the standards. <laughs> I think about this stuff all the time, and um, I actually do a lot of reading on a lot of the stuff that we was talking about. 
And it's actually on, um, there's a TV channel called Curry. I don't know if you're not familiar with it. They actually did something about the prisons and all, basically something like this to go on the show. Um, I like everybody coming out and everybody doing this, but I just want to know the, 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 what solution do you think is really going to come from this? Like, you said it's um, sustaining this, and that's very important. Like, the trademark market, everybody came out for a few weeks, but a few months, but to sustain something like a Black Panther movie or a civil rights movement, do you think this is the actual right time or era for this to actually happen? Yeah. I mean, because yeah. I'm not. I, <laughs> I'm not saying that this did not happen. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying in a day where I see more black people go for money. Everything was about money. Everybody wants to be a king. Everyone wants to be a queen. But nobody wants to be, uh, they don't want, they, they want everyone wants to be at the top, right? Like you said with the model of the king, there was a lot of people behind them. Right? Everybody wants to be the front, being the forefront. Do you think that this can actually happen where I believe that the Martin Luther King was a boycott. Do you think that can happen today? If, if someone went to boycott the MTA, or do you see the prices going up all the time? Where I feel that in today's world, more people will say, no, I'm going for my job. Instead of instead of everybody wanting to do something different. I mean, if it can happen, I wish it can, but I just know you're excited. Can I get to Personal answer to that is that uh, if we don't, you know, if we can stand down, we don't try to just be even more now, it's not going to get anybody. That's just my personal answer because I think a lot about that too. And even though I have the ideals, I, uh, and, and I think those are things that uh, aren't exactly at the right time period for people's mentalities and the way we live down here. But uh, if we don't start trying for change, nothing will happen. And uh, I just wanted to express, because my question about it is uh, privatization of uh, prisons, which we touched upon, so I'm not sending wants to say, what else can we do other than write to a legislator, or you know, just ideas on how to keep combating it. I just want to say how much I love, uh, you know, the talks about creating education, uh, pursuing enlightenment, and just being long-sighted in our goals, because so many things are just put upon us, and like so many people think in the short term that they fail to see the long term, and just seeing so many things promote that, and everyone in this room would go away with that, is, 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 that's my so, Thank you. is about um, activism, and a lot of the time when we, um, we do protests, we do different movements, different marches, different um, parades, or it's called, it's called what's on, and marches. We always go through and we get um, permits. We always do it, it's called legally through the papers, and we stop basically having, it's called protests, having marches without basically, without like notice. What's, we're not really having, it's called, I feel, an effect because we're giving this warning and we're getting a time that is given to us and further notice that we're going to be here, we're going to protest, and then people are working around us. I feel like we're not having the effect that we really can because a protest is supposed to be disruptive, it's civil disobedience. And are we really being disobedient? Are we really doing something when we go through the, the channels and the actions that we've been forced to lately? And so my question is to you is that um, what do you think about the, the way that we've begun to protest, the way we've begun to organize, versus the way that um, it was formerly in the 60s and the civil rights movement, where we just acted and we just had our marches, we had our protests, and we actually did disrupt um, the community, we actually had an effect and disrupted the, um, the regular day-to-day -day, um, life.
effectively destroyed, yeah. um, and it destroyed in a very short period across the nation, right? Um, and so what I want to say is that I think that one thing that's important is that after this big, this big era of change, this big, what we might call rupture in the discourse of the 60s and 70s, civil rights, gay rights, women's rights, okay? That sort of opening up and, and re-establishment of laws and new laws protecting us. It seems to me that, I'm thinking about this while watching your film, Matt, it seems to me that since that big era of rupture and transformation of our society, now the 1% or whatever we want to call it, the power structure, whatever word we give it, has, has re-entrenched and made it so that now um, the right to organize, the right to have Occupy Wall Street has been effectively outlawed. The right to have a civil rights movement has been effectively outlawed. Do, do you so, that, so, that, so that what that means is in order for us to sustain the movement, whatever the movement is, the Trayvon movement, the Occupy movement, the movement to end mass incarceration, the movement to end stop and frisk, if we're going to have these movements and sustain them, we are going to have to be prepared to sustain them at huge, huge cost and risk. Because Occupy Wall Street was effectively dis was effectively disassembled with violence, with pepper spray, right? With the shutdown of Zuccotti Park, literally in two weeks. Massive movement, right, across the world that established new paradigms was essentially ended was essentially beaten to death in two weeks. It happened here, it happened in Oakland, it happened in Ohio, it happened in Northern California. It was a systematic process of saying, we are having no Occupy Wall Street, right? Wisconsin. Okay, Wisconsin, it was across this country. So clearly it was systematic, do you see what I'm so, so that means when we have movement now, we have to recognize that they figured out how to put it down since the 70s. Right? They have figured out how to, how to, so, so that we're going to have to, in order to keep it alive, right, like I'm really, really disappointed that Occupy has fizzled in the aftermath of that two weeks of attacks. It just fizzled. So how do we bring Occupy back, and, and how do we have other movements we need to, I'm sorry, I'm going on and on, but how do we have other movements is we have to be prepared that when it gets tough, that we don't fall apart. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think also Occupy um, was, is, was never going to be the final movement in the form that it was because if it's only about these small encampments, then they can be raided and torn apart. So part of the question that Occupy leaves us with is how do you get that, which was so hopeful and has changed the whole discourse of brought back class politics to this country, to become a mass movement, to have meetings that working people can become involved with, that people in school, you know, that don't have time to be at a four-hour um, meeting, you know, to a GA, you know, I participated in those. It's like, so how do you get this to become, to go to the schools, to go to the workplaces, to get into the streets and not just, um, uh, you know, small encampments, but I totally echo that, your notion. Um, I think one part of it is that they have jailed a whole generation of future political leaders. I mean, if you think about that, and historically, whenever the black community, black communities in America have fought back, they're at the forefront of progressive revolutionary change. So slavery, really, you know, the, the overcoming of slavery, the slave rebellions, the Civil War, changed the mindset of more than just black people in this country. It really inspired poor white farmers and things like that. The Civil Rights Movement inspired the black car movement, inspired the women's rights, the gay movement, you know, Vietnam, anti-Vietnam War movement. And I think the powers that be, the 1% the ruling class, understand that it's dangerous when the black community organizes. And just think about that. Not only did they jail or assassinate all the black Panther Party leaders, SNCC, those, they jailed their sons and grandsons before they even become political. That's how dangerous you are to the system. Yeah. You know? But even 
even that isn't enough to stop people from organizing. I mean, it's not. People are, you know, the general strike in the Georgia jails. You know, people are rising up. And I think what Occupy did was it brought back the idea, that and the Arab Spring, that revolution is possible, even in the harshest forms. You know, who would think that under uh, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, are those people ever going to fight back and get rid of a two decades old dictatorship? You know, so like, be careful. You know, of being not hopeful. Anger. You know, there's stuff simmering under the surface, and we never know when it's going to to explode. But again, we need to like be ready and take advantage of that energy when it when it comes. Two, stop asking for permits. 
and start being attentive. And to be, the key word to activist is to be active. If you have a problem with stop and frisk, why have you not been down to the trial at least once? Why have you not, you know what I mean? So be a part of these things. Take your class, take your school, contact other schools. How? Go to that school. You know what I mean? Like, make an effort. So being an activist is being an activist. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you for sticking around, everybody. Brothers, wonderful as usual. The new one, Matthew, brother Matthew, you've been inducted now, brother Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so I really don't have much to say. You guys hit on all statistics, all corners, all borders. Excellent. I just want to say, I like the, the terminology, brother, the word brother and sisters for the ones that stuck around as well. I'm loving how that is being used more and more. It's not just a different thing to say. When I say brother, I mean in a global standpoint. You're my brother, you're my sister, regardless of what this is. So I'm, I'm loving that. <laughs> just a few things, like five said, brother five. It's the truth. Who, we don't hold our local government accountable as much. We all run out for presidential elections, but we don't go for any of the assemblymen's or your councilman, we don't do that. And we have one of them that's coming up that was a part of the foolishness that allowed Bloomberg to do a third term, which is Christine Quinn. So if we could have seen that from before and started voting earlier, maybe we could have stopped it before she reached where she's at. So we, we need to be more active on a local level. Secondly, Kazimbi, right behind us, spoke of CUNY back in the 70s being free. Yeah. We have a dilemma going on right now. I think about two years ago, they passed that um, tuition could go up 14%, and it's 2% every year, so you're saying about seven years. It's gonna be about $1,500 more than it is now. They're already assuming that you're taking money just to spend it on rent, clothes, whatever you would like to buy or whatever. They're gonna eat into that. Soon you're not gonna have any more money left over, and soon CUNY won't even be affordable to you guys. So I want you to spread that amongst the community that CUNY will no, no longer be that institution where you get an education for cheap. It was for free, now it's for cheap, then it'll be expensive, then it'll be no longer attainable. So that's the next step. And thirdly, I mean, there was something on my brain This I don't even know how to capture it anymore because you guys touched it. This, let me leave you with Malcolm X. Malcolm X was dangerous from jump. They knew he was dangerous. What made him very dangerous to the point that they had to X him out, he knew that it's not just a black problem, it's a human rights yes. problem. Thank you. That's no problem. All right, so once you started speaking, on that level, it became dangerous and they had to wipe them out. Right. So black, black, white, 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 and black, I think that's the strongest bond. Whatever color, green, yellow, let's make it happen. Nothing can stop us, regardless of what money and capitalism machine they have behind them. Yes. Things that very, very short. I think mean, one of the things that we have to do is to get into the literary. Um, now, I think you brother mentioned the, the New Negro, um, which I am not um, basically you know, you know, extend to a, you know, to, to a greater point. And I, I think the, one of the things that the New Negro happened is that the, the Harlem Renaissance came out from that. And, you know, I, I don't want to tell anyone here about the Harlem Renaissance. You guys know every, everyone. So I, I think that one, one thing that we have to start to do is to find, you know, maybe a solution. You know, we have we must educate it, but I remember we have to do that. I don't mean not educate, but we must build the consciousness. But education is not but we must build the consciousness. And and to build the consciousness I think that the the literary you know, writing it, it will be important. So we have to upon this time, you know, printing some form of paper or some Maybe just a page or so, and, and so that we'll be able to, um, you know, like all of these statistics we'll put together and, and try to build the consciousness. I think that's one way. So, because we have to build it, and in order to build it, we can build it on, 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 on a kind of a, a you know, ground that is going to collapse. So, we must build it on, on form, concrete, and, you know, um, a strong ground. And, and to do that, we have to build each other so that we'll be able to, to get the most benefit from each other. But, so, I think some form of literary. Um, publication, well, not even a publication, but something that you could have that maybe a week or every two weeks, or maybe every month that you could just print things. I think that's one of the ways that we could do the movement in. All right? Postcards. Okay, Mark has a